Welcome to lecture number three for ECE 320, Digital Electronics. In this lecture, we'll review CircuitLab and MATLAB. Now, typically, circuit design happens in three steps, and we'll also be doing the same thing in this class. The first step is to design your circuit on paper. That's where you do the analysis to calculate the voltages, currents, uh, find the resistances, capacitance values, things like that. To check your design, typically you simulate your circuit. That's what CircuitLab does for you. Uh, MATLAB sometimes helps as well. The third step then is to build your circuit and see if it actually works in hardware. In electronics, we're typically doing all three. You know, design your circuit on paper, check it in CircuitLab, then in hardware, build the circuit, collect data, and verify that your analysis was correct. The tools that we'll be using to do that in this class are the following. We've got MATLAB. MATLAB is a tool that makes circuit design analysis a lot easier. Kind of think of MATLAB like a calculator, but it's a calculator that can solve 50 equations for 50 unknowns. It graphs the results. It can even solve nonlinear equations. CircuitLab is a very friendly circuit simulator that allows you to build circuits using drag and drop. Once built, you can find the voltages, currents, do time domain simulations, see what the waveforms look like. Then in the lab, you've got breadboards, oscilloscopes, and multimeters. Those let you build the circuit and then collect data, either the voltages, like a multimeter, or to see the waveform shape and oscilloscope. In this lecture, we're going to look at CircuitLab and MATLAB. So let's start with CircuitLab. CircuitLab is an exceedingly nice, friendly program. Um, I really like it. It's fairly intuitive, meaning you can jump right in, and there's many tutorials on YouTube available for using CircuitLab. To start out with CircuitLab, you need to create an account. If you use your NDSU email address, it's free. Um, NDSU Electrical Engineering pays for a university license every year. So again, any, any, any student at NDSU can use CircuitLab as long as they have an NDSU email address. Otherwise, it's $34 a year, which is a really reasonable price. The advantage is if you have a license, you can save your circuits. Uh, for example, I do have a license, so I get to find my old circuits. Kind of like if I do this, I do File, Open. And let's sort by name. These are various circuits we use in EC111, uh, in 320. That's what's nice about having a, a paid membership, is you can save your stuff, and you also have an unlimited amount of time. You can be sitting there playing with CircuitLab. To start out, let's start with the new circuit. Again, this is what CircuitLab looks like when you start out. It's a little bit slow because I'm running, because I'm not running Zoom. Well, it's a little bit slow right now on my internet connection. These are your shopping lists. These are the various components you can add. You've got your voltage sources, resistances, uh, sine wave, step, um, op amps. This is an op amp where you don't care about the power supply, op amp where you do care about the power supply, diodes, we'll be covering these in class, transistors, MOSFETs, uh, stuff from circuits one, your voltage controlled current source, uh, voltage controlled voltage source. Those are really transistors. In this class, we'll be using the transistor models. Uh, relays, it's even useful for digital electronics, um, 275. You've got your AND gates, OR gates, clocks. Uh, basically, you could use this in 275 if you want. Block diagrams, stuff you'd use in 461 control systems. Uh, you know, re really nice program. So let's start out. Suppose I want to build a circuit, like a two-stage resistor circuit. I'll start with the voltage source, a resistor. If I hold down R, I can rotate the resistor and put it where I want. And again, just kind of place them on the screen. If you change your mind, you can move them around. You need a ground. 
all circuits need a ground. Uh, once you have your components placed, you can then connect them. That's just drag and drop. Left click on one, tell it where I want it to go, then right click, or release. Hold down the left button, release. Hold down the left button, release. Left button, release. That lets you draw your circuit. Um, if I double click, I can change the numbers. So let's make this 900 ohms. <coughs> 900 ohms, 800. You can also do things like 3K. That's 3 kilo ohms. Uh, there's also M, capital M is mega ohm, lowercase m is milli ohm. They are different. Oops. And volt source. Let's make that a 10 volt source. Kind of optional, but I like doing this is these are labels. I can sit there and label the different nodes. Oftentimes I like to make these match the homework assignment. So this is V0, V1, V2, V3. I've got the different voltages and just to be consistent, this doesn't really matter, but I'll just make this label match that label. I've drawn my circuit. Now to solve it, down here at the bottom of the screen, I have simulate. If I click on simulate, I have all these different options. Start with DC. DC is if I have a DC source, all the voltages and currents are just a number, a constant. So I can sit there and say, what is the voltage of V0, V1, V2, V3, run, and it just solved. If I solve the circuit in MATLAB, I should get the same answers. In Circuit Lab, I can also find the currents. If I click on the left side of the resistor, it'll tell me the current going from the left side to the right side. And so those are the currents going through them. Now that's OK, so that's the one approach. That's for DC. There's a DC sweep. Let's go back under build. If I take a nonlinear element, uh, let's see. Well, actually kind of backing up. One mistake people oftentimes make is they'll make this 10V. Circuit Lab doesn't want that. It wants the number 10. If I make that 10V and I solve for the voltages, I get zero. Again, it doesn't know what 10V is. I want it to be 10. Make that 10, it knows it's a voltage, it's 10 volts. I can solve. That's a DC. What DC sweep does, well, let's actually do that a little bit later. Uh, for time domain, DC isn't really exciting in the time domain. If I do a time domain uh, simulation, I can sit there and say, let's start at zero seconds, let's run for three milliseconds, time step, thousand times smaller, three microseconds. And let's look at the voltage at V0, V1, V2, and V3. Okay, what did I do wrong? Add expression, V1, V2, V3, run. This is what you're going to see on the oscilloscope. Uh, DC is kind of boring. It doesn't change. So I could just use a number. What time domain is for is if my input is a sine wave. So suppose, let's delete this guy. I'm going to click on it, hit delete button, and it's gone. Add a sine wave as a source. So if I double click on this, this could be a sine wave. It's one kilohertz. Let's make it a 10 volt sine wave. And you can choose sine, triangle, sawtooth, square wave. I'm going to use the sine wave. Uh, now when I simulate under time domain, I can see the waveforms. So this is a one kilohertz sine wave. I ran it for three milliseconds, so I get three cycles. If you want to print this, if I do, well, if I can highlight this part of the curve and then export plot image, this is just a graph that's nice to include on your homework sets. Use the snipping tool. I can copy paste that 
into my Word document and turn that in. You can also sit there and move along the waveform and see what the voltages are and the times. Where that's really more useful is if I have capacitors in the circuit. Capacitors don't do anything in DC, but they do have an effect at AC. So let's add a capacitor right here. Let's add another capacitor. And another capacitor. Again, the capacitors missed. If you double click on them, I can change the value. Uh, one microfarad is one U, one millifarad is one lowercase m, a capital M is one megafarad, it is different, uh, nanofarads, picofarads. Now if I simulate, you can see that the voltages drop and there's a time delay. With AC, I have both an amplitude and a phase shift in polar form. The amplitude is the amplitude. The delay is the phase shift. So this guy is delayed, and like this is 360 degrees. This delay is about one sixth of 360, about 60 degree phase shift. I can sit there and click on it and see that this peak is at 1.254 milliseconds. This peak is at 1.332 milliseconds. Take the difference in time divided by the period. That's how much the delay is. Times 360 gives you the delay in, in degrees. So, okay, so that's uh, the time domain simulation. What frequency domain does down here is I can sit there and let's vary V2, this guy. I want to go from 1 hertz to say 1000 hertz, let's have 20 points per decade, and I want to look at V3. And let's not look at phase. Uh, the standard is dB. I personally like amplitude, it's kind of your pick. But plot the magnitude of the output and run. It's going to sweep the input from 1 hertz to 1000 hertz, and here's the gain. The output is 0.67, and then the gain drops off. This is a low pass filter. That's what the time domain or frequency do, uh, design does. DC sweep. Uh, let's start over. Control N. Control N gives me a new circuit. Okay. Control N gave me a new web page. Uh, let's do file new. File new gives you a new circuit. I've got a slow internet connection here. Okay, for the DC sweep, that's typically for nonlinear elements that we'll be covering this class, like a diode. Uh, suppose I have a diode right here. I've got a voltage source. Let's do a constant voltage source and a resistance. Yeah, sure, one volt, why not? Connect them all up. All circuits need a ground. If you don't have a ground, you're going to get an error message. Let's call that V1 and V2. I can sit there and plot what happens to V2 as V1 varies. So if we go under simulate, let's do a DC sweep. I want to vary, you know, you can vary pretty much anything you want. I can vary the resistance, I can vary the diode, I can vary the voltage. I want to vary the V1's voltage. I'm going to start at, say, minus 2 volts, 
go to plus two volts, steps of 0.01, and I want to look at V2. Now I'll run. We'll generate a graph saying that V2, actually let's do something else. Let's also look at V1. So the orange line is V1, the blue line is V2. Uh, the output equals the input up until I get to here. And then the output kind of clips at about 0.7 volts. Um, diodes are nonlinear elements. Uh, sometimes it kind of helps to see what's happening in the circuit by doing a sweep. I can also do the voltage versus current, current characteristic. Let's see, go back to build. Let's get rid of you, delete, replace you with a current source. There we are. Now we're going to simulate. I'm going to vary the current. It's going to go from zero to two amps, steps to 0.01. And let's look at the voltage V2. And this is the VI characteristics for diode, kind of rotated. So as the current goes up, the voltage stays, no, uh, as the voltage goes up, the current is basically zero up until I get to about point seven two five volts, 726 millivolts. Then as the voltage goes up, the current goes up. So that's kind of circuit lab. Again, a very, very easy, friendly to use program. Typically on the homework, I'll ask you to design on paper, then go into circuit lab and check your design. Um, for example, let's pull up a file that we're gonna be using a little bit later. Oops, I didn't wanna do that. Let's do file, open. And a little bit of foreshadowing. Yeah, like here's a 555 timer. This we'll be getting to a little bit later in the semester. But with Circuit Lab, what I can do is if I design the 555 timer on paper, I can check my design and see if it works. So like here's a 555 timer. I've got these resistors, capacitors. The output should be a square wave. That's a V1, and VC will be charging and discharging capacitor. I'll pick these and calculate the frequency that it should appear on V1. I could then check. When I simulate it, let's go from, well, there's the starting transient. If I go from zero to five milliseconds, I think the period is supposed to be one millisecond, so it'd be five cycles. Make the step size a thousand times smaller. A thousand is a nice number. If it's too much smaller, it takes a long time to run. If it's not enough, I get a really coarse graph and I can't really tell what's going on. I've got the starting transient. I start at zero volts, take some time to charge up, and then I reach steady state. If instead I say, let's start at 10 milliseconds, and go to 15 milliseconds, that'll skip that initial transient as you start up and then just go to straight to steady state. This is why you don't want to use more than a thousand points. It takes a long time to run. I get this graph. So this is the voltage on the capacitor. It's discharging, charging, discharging, 
Here's the voltage at the output, it's a square wave, and it can sit there and measure the period. Uh, this time is 12.17 milliseconds. This is 11.34 milliseconds. The difference tells you the on time. This right here is 10.62 milliseconds. Take the difference, I can get you the off time. I can find the on time and off time using Circuit Lab and check to see if that matches my calculations. Uh, we'll be doing that a little bit later. So that's pretty much the Circuit Lab. Uh, again, I highly recommend it. In fact, it's going to be a lot of the homework. You don't really have to use Circuit Lab. That's kind of what we just did. In this class, you need to use something. Um, I highly recommend Circuit Lab. It's really nice, really friendly. Um, again, I recommend it. But again, if you want to use Spice, LT Spice, uh, whatever, find find by me. Second thing to cover today is MATLAB. Uh, MATLAB is basically a calculator, but it's a calculator that can solve n equations and unknowns. It can solve nonlinear equations. It can simulate nonlinear dynamic systems. Um, it's basically really friendly, really useful. It's become the industrial standard in electrical computer engineering. Just want to go through a quick review of MATLAB. The console, the editor, what scripts are, what functions are, and graphing. Now starting out with the console window. When you start up MATLAB, if we can find it. Okay, here's MATLAB. Uh, typically when you start MATLAB, it looks like this. And that's the default layout. I don't like it. It's got a lot of information I really don't care about. Let's squeeze this down so it fits in my window. Come on, here we go. Uh, here's the list of the directories. Again, I don't care. Uh, list of my variables, I don't care. My previous commands, I don't care. Close them all down. There's the command window. This is a calculator. I can do things like say, what is 3 plus 5? And the answer is 8. I can do 3 divided by 5. Answer is 0.6. I can say, what is 6 factorial? MATLAB has a really help, useful help command, or help menu. Also, on the last page of the lecture notes, there's a list of useful MATLAB commands. It's not exhaustive. MATLAB's been around for at least 30, maybe 40 years. So people have been adding functions to it year after year. Um, I have no idea what all the functions are, but mostly just use it like a calculator. So, you know, that's one option. I can do variables. I can say a equals 3, b equals 4, c equals a plus b plus b cubed. Answer 67. Now, MATLAB can also do things like a semicolon. A semicolon says, do the operation, but don't display the answer. If I take out the semicolon, it says, do the operation, and, and display the, the result. There's also arrow up command. Arrow up brings up all your old commands. Um, I find that really useful. If you're lazy like me, don't like retyping all the time, just do arrow up. More importantly, MATLAB is a matrix language. If I say square bracket, that's the start of a matrix. 1, 2, 3. Semicolon is next row. 4, 5, 6. I just input a 2 by 3 matrix. If I input another matrix, B equals 1, 2, 3, 4, 9, 8, I just put in, put in a 3 by 2 matrix. So you can input matrices in MATLAB as well. With matrices, you can add. If they have the same dimension, I can say what is A plus A plus A. Adds them all up. Uh, if they have different dimensions, like A and B don't have compatible dimensions, I get an error message. You can multiply. A times B. If the inner dimension matches, it makes sense. So here I've got a 
2 by 3 times a 3 by 2. The answer is a 2 by 2. And the way they multiply is you take the first row times the first column. That's the 1-1 one, one element of the result. First column times the first row times the second column. That's element 1-2. Stuff you covered in Math 129. Um, for us, we don't care. MATLAB will do it right. MATLAB's been pretty well debugged. The answer is correct. You can do a uh, matrix inverse. The inverse of C is spelled INV. And the property of the inverse is a matrix times this inverse is the identity matrix. There's a couple other ones that are standard, like the identity matrix, a 4x4 identity matrix, looks like that, 4x4 four four matrix of zeros, in case you want to just have an empty matrix to start with. Um, so again, MATLAB does matrices as well. With MATLAB, I can solve n equations and unknowns. So for example, if I have rand is a random number, let's generate a 5x5 five five matrix of random numbers. Let's have B be a 5x1 matrix. If I have five equations, five unknowns, so like this is my first equation, the first row, second equation, this is your times A, B, C, D, E equals that. 0.9a plus 0.2b plus 0.97c equals 0.74. I can solve. The solution is the inverse of a times b. With MATLAB, I can solve five equations, five unknowns, really, really easily. MATLAB can also do complex numbers. Again, in electrical engineering, we live and breathe complex numbers. j is the square root of minus 1. That's the default. You can redefine it if you want, but default is j is the square root of minus 1. I could say, uh, let's see. I could have a 5 by 5 matrix of random numbers, of complex numbers. And solve. Okay, MATLAB doesn't care. If you have complex numbers, real numbers, it'll solve. This we'll find useful later on. In AC analysis, the real part means cosine, minus J means sine. So this would be, I've got some complex impedances, resistors, inductors, capacitors, gives you complex impedances. Um, I have complex voltages, real parts cosine, minus J is sine, solve. It can do it. It doesn't care. Real numbers, complex numbers, doesn't matter. That's the console. Uh, another nice thing in MATLAB is you can do scripts. If I do file, new, script, what a script does is if I'm going to write the same code over and over again, I might want to write, write a script in here, so instead of having to write it over and over again, I can just run the script. For example, uh, let's do Let's do dice. If I type in rand, rand is a random number. If I do rand of 1, 5, that gives me five random numbers between 0 and 1. And there's actually two rands. R-A-N-D-N is a Gaussian distribution random number, mean of 0, standard deviation of 1. That's your standard bell-shaped curve. It goes from minus 1 to plus 1. Um, in this case for dice, I just want numbers between 0 and 1. Multiply by 6, I get numbers between 0 and 5.999999. Round up, which is the stealing command. Uh, floor is round down, stealing is round up. There I've got 6 dice. Suppose I want to roll a level 7 fireball. What I want to do is roll 7 dice and take the sum. So there the answer is 23. So let's do that. Let's take, copy that into here. And every time I run it, let's do it this way.
I'm going to roll seven six-sided dice. It's going to ask me for a name. Uh, doesn't matter what it is. Every time I run this code, I get that. Uh, let's say I want to do seven dice throughout the low. So here I have seven dice throughout the low, which is throughout a two. At the rest, I get 23. That's kind of what scripts do. I don't have to sit there and retype the code over and over again. I can sit there and modify it. If I want to do nine dice, eight dice throughout the low, and throw in a semicolon, it says don't print the results. That's the script. A function is a little bit different. File, new, function. A function is a subroutine. What a subroutine does is you've got these different functions in MATLAB, uh, like rand, um, cosine, sine. I can create my own function. Let's roll a fireball that is n dice. So this is a subroutine. I'm going to pass it the variable n, how many dice I want to roll. It's going to roll n six-sided dice, take the sum, and that's the damage. So what I'll do is dice the ceiling of And at the first time when I run it, I'm going to take out the semicolons. Uh, when I save it, I need to save it as the name that I give it right here. Right now in MATLAB, if I type in Fireball, it says, I have no idea what you're talking about. If I save this, File, Save, use the default name in your current directory, I now can do that. It now knows what that is. And what without the semicolons, I can sit there and see, here's the damage that I did. Add them all up. Did I get 46? And I don't really know. So let's try three dice. Five plus one plus one is seven. That looks good. Two plus three plus five is 10. That looks good. Once I'm convinced my function works, throw in the semicolons save it. It can now do things, say, what is a level three fireball, which actually doesn't exist. You need to be at least fifth level to cast fireball. Level five fireball did 13 damage, 20 damage, 15 damage. Uh, level 15 fireball, if you're a mage, 52 damage, 46 damage. That's what functions do for you. If there's a routine I want to call, I can create a function, and once it's created, anybody can use it. So that's some of the nice things in MATLAB. What MATLAB is also really nice for is it does graphics. So we say, let's tap time, go between zero. Well, let's do this. The single quote is a transpose. I just made this a column vector. I like column vectors more than row vectors. This is a counter going from zero to five in steps of 0.1. If I do 0.1, it'll go 0 to 1 in steps of 0.1. Let's have it go 0 to 5 in steps of 0.01. And don't display the result because there's a lot of them. I can do graphics. I can say plot x versus time versus x where I have cosine, and that's what it looks like. Let's do it for a little bit longer. Let's make it 15 seconds. I can do graphics. Um, there's also a bunch of different types of graph types. 
if I have y is equal to sine of t, I can put two things on the same graph. Plot t versus x, t versus y. And you have your two outputs. Let's bring this over. Um, I can change the colors. Let's make the first graph um, red. dots, or a red line, that's a line. Uh, the second one, let's make that a cyan dash line. You can change what the lines look like. Label the axis. Then you do a screenshot, include that in your homework. Um, again, a MATLAB is just really nice. for It does uh, graphs, plot your data as well. So that's kind of a quick summary. There's a lot more that MATLAB will do. At the end of this, there's kind of a summary of MATLAB commands. I guess there's not a summary of MATLAB commands. Um, one last thing for MATLAB. If you ever get stuck, just type in help. MATLAB has a really nice help menu. If you want to do something like plot, say help plot, and it'll tell you how do you plot data. You know, more information than you ever wanted. And, and again, if you really get stuck, just look at the homework, previous homework sets and solutions in the class. Typically, if there's a MATLAB assignment, um, I'll include the code. Um, I'm not sure which one would have that. But if there's a MATLAB assignment, I've got this the code in there that you can look at. Uh, that should kind of get you started on the homework. But you know, basically, MATLAB is a tool. If the tool helps, use it. CircuitLab is a tool. If it helps, use it. Um, I highly recommend. So anyway, that's uh, lecture number three for MATLAB and CircuitLab.